has pretty low standards on a donor checkups. For example, in my country, in Germany, um, a donor has to be checked every fifth donation. You don't have that process in the United States. Like there can be issues with donating too much plasma. So bodies, uh, everybody is different. And what I learned from the reporting, talking to a lot of doctors, is that there are some people who can maybe donate up to four times a week. There are others, for them, it could be risky to donate once a week. I talked to, for example, one donor, um, Genesis, who lives in Ciudad Juarez, and she was fainting a lot during and after the donation. She was sick very, very often, but she continued donating because of the money. This business uses uh, the inequality along the US-Mexican border, promising up to, in 2019, $400 a month for people who make inquiries, maybe on average around $200. And so tell me a little more about that. There were all of these facilities set up very close to the border. And in Mexico, um, selling plasma is illegal, right? Correct. If you take one example, if you cross one of the main border bridges and then you walk for five minutes, um, then you basically fall into one of the first plasma donation centers. And what we see now from the court filings is that these centers um, made up to 10% of the entire blood plasma collected in the United States. And the companies also now reveal in the court filings that of course this was a strategic effort, as they call it, aiming towards Mexican nationals so they could walk over and uh, yeah, sell their blood plasma there. So, so the federal government stepped in and took action on this? There's this health question, and then another issue that we also reported on was the question of the legality of using a visitor visa for Mexican nationals to cross the border into the States. And a year ago, after we started uh, digging uh, into this and after we published the reporting, and then after the pandemic started and the border was closed, and still some of the um, uh, CBP officers decided to now officially let um, plasma donors cross uh, declaring them as an essential business and others didn't let them cross at all, CBP then decided to um, to issue an internal guidance, basically um, ending up halting the entire business. And that has been stopped now a year ago. The uh, pharma companies now say they have lost more, more or less five, uh, 4 million liters of blood plasma. Um, um, so 6% uh, of the entire plasma collected uh, in the world. How is that affecting um, people who need plasma? It's a very slow business. So basically, if you have less plasma donated today, you will only feel that in about like eight to 10 months. Will there be uh, shortages of specific medicine? Will there be higher prices um, for the patients? Um, that is something that could happen if the, if the companies don't react and build more plasma facilities also in other parts of the country or also abroad. So I guess with all of that said, what are you hearing from all of the different stakeholders involved in this? What I'm hearing from the donors is, of course, they're angry. They say this is money they very much need. Um, at the same time, I hear a lot of donors saying, well, finally, there will be some clarification and we will understand if what we're doing is something real or not. From the donation centers across um, the border, I'm hearing they are basically out of business now. Um, lots of the centers cut hours, had to lay off most of their employees. And from the companies, of course, I'm hearing that they hope they will have a success before court. And they, of course, are stressing now, this is basically precipitating the health crisis. Reporter Stephanie Dalt, thank you so very much. Thank you. Guaranteed income programs are becoming more common across the U.S. These temporary programs are largely being championed by progressive big city mayors. The hope is giving hundreds of dollars a month to people struggling financially will help reduce income inequality. For the Gulf States newsroom, Stephen Bissaha and Aubrey Uhas report on a new program in Georgia that's trying to reach people outside those big cities.
drive about two and a half hours south from Atlanta, and you'll end up in the rural town of Cuthbert, Georgia. People here say it's a nice and quiet place to retire. It's also in one of the poorest parts of the state. The county's poverty rate is more than twice Georgia's, a state already known for high poverty. Which is why Tamika Acosta is standing outside the local Dollar General. She's an outsider with a flyer. She's got a pitch that's hard to ignore. $850, no strings attached though, ma'am. Can I explain that to you? And that, that kind of makes them say, okay, we're just talking about it. Acosta is getting people to sign up for In Her Hands. It's a guaranteed income program that will give hundreds of low-income women in Georgia $850 a month for two years. Women, especially black women, face higher rates of poverty than men. So this program's hoping to address that. Word spreads fast here, so most of the women Acosta talks to have already heard the program, including Wanda Blackman. Acosta helps Blackman complete her application. All done. Now you will receive an email. Uh, there's already a problem with that. Just okay. Of course. Aubrey, there are dozens of cities trying to build the political will to make a guaranteed income federal policy. And they're doing that by running pilots in their own cities. Right. While Inner Hands is doing that in Atlanta, they're also taking the unusual step of giving money to people in three rural counties here in southwest Georgia. Now, it's a lot cheaper living in a rural area like Cuthbert than Atlanta, but people in Atlanta often have access to a lot more help. Blackman says there also aren't many jobs here where you can make good money and that here yeah, is it's no it's no job and it, it is a job you ain't making that much of money. Logging used to be the big industry here decades ago, but not anymore. Lots of people who grew up here either leave for better jobs elsewhere or they come back once they retire. Turns out if you're going to do a rural guaranteed income, you're probably going to end up giving a lot of money to retirees who are struggling to get by on social security. Yeah, like grandmother Evelyn Evans. She got the pitch for the program at the grocery store. Yeah, when she said $850, I said, wow. Evans, who was 78 years old, knew she wanted to apply, but wasn't sure how to complete the online application. Um, leave anybody out in our celebration. I remember getting those Tony Oliva uh, trading cards as a kid. Always appreciated the, the lines of stats on the backs and always wondered, why is this guy not in? So... Finally, that wrong is corrected as well today. He's Bucky Brooks. I'm Mike Herman. Fox Sports Radio. Fox Sports Sunday. Coming up next, we've got Kyler Murray and his big deal. But first, it's Ilo with What's Trending. What's going on, buddy? Mike, I've got a treat for you coming up very shortly just for you. But in the meantime, guys, we actually have some legitimate, honest-to-goodness, fresh NFL news Let's for go. you this morning. Buffalo Bills head coach Sean McDermott announcing a short time ago the two-time Pro Bowl cornerback Tredavious White will begin training camp on the physically unable-to-perform list as he continues to recover from tearing his ACL.